the guy look like? Uh, how do you expect us to help you if you don't know what the guy looks like? Hi, Lieutenant. Hello, Sergeant. Where are the boys? Oh, we have them set up for you inside. Uh huh. Come on. All what right. are we gonna get the take two shots, Lieutenant? Yeah, well, can we see him, huh? Now, fellas, we'll be through with this as soon as we possibly can. Oh, come on, come on. Come on. This is Hank Bell. He'll handle the preliminary. Captain Larson. Captain? You know Whitey. Sure. Sit over there. Uh, sit down. Okay, Whitey, preliminary interrogation. DA's office, Assistant District Attorney Bell, Detective Lieutenant Gunnison. Witnesses, Captain Larson. Officer? Wallman. Officer Wallman. Suspects. Three members of a street gang known as the Thunderbirds. Named? Arthur Reardon, Anthony Aposto, and Daniel D-I-P-A-C-E, DePace. Which one of you is DePace? Your name, Apache? David Copperfield. All right, you want me to belt you around the room? Hey, he ain't right in that. Here's the Apache. Your father, John Apache? I ain't got no father. Your mother's name, Mary? Well, what the hell has my mother got to do with it? Nothing, kid. How old are you, Danny? I'm 15. You can't hold me in this police station. You can't even question me. I'm a juvenile. You're a juvenile up to 16 unless you kill somebody, and you did. He stopped again. All right. Gunnison. The law says you can execute a 15-year-old for murder, but it also says you can't question him in a police station. Now, look. I'm tired of having to coddle these punks because they're 15 instead of 16. You don't have to tell me about these kids. I was born in this neighborhood. I went to school with some of the worst gunsels in town. A good swift kick will do more to straighten out these punks than anything. Gunnison, we're not out to kick kids this time. We're out for first degree murder. Putting a juvenile in the chair is always big trouble. Whoever prosecutes this case will need a clear record the defense can't attack. No technicalities getting in the way, like interrogating a juvenile in the police station. Right? Okay. Let's find out the ages of the other two, and then we'll separate the baby killers from the adult killers. Okay, Whitey. You, name and age. Arthur Reardon, 17. Batman. What's your name? A Anthony Apostol. How old are you? 16. Their home's been called, Captain? Strictly according to the book, Counselor. Mrs. Departure and Reardon's old man are outside now. Take him out to see his mother. You're a big shaft, man. You didn't find the knives on us. We found a lot of holes in the body. We'll find the knives. We started it. We pulled the knife. So now he's dead like he should be. Why do you figure he pulled the knife? He was on his turf. He's on your turf? You pull the knife? We ain't no dirty spicks. We're thunderbirds. You know the name of the boy you killed? Uh, we never seen him before. His name was Roberto Escalante. He was 15 years old. So? Now, let me get this straight. You went for a walk on his street. He saw you. He came at you with a knife, right? Yeah, that's right. He must have been pretty good with a knife. It's crazy. In fact, he must have been better with a knife than anybody in the whole world because Roberto Escalante was blind.
So, in, in view of Tully switch to guilty, I think I'll be free to take over the teenage killing case, if, if you'd like me to. I mean, <laughs> it sounds like a toughie. And I'd like something to get my teeth into for a change, something I can really identify with. Yes, well, I've asked Hank to handle the preliminary on that. How about it, Hank? Well, the facts in the case are just about as reported. The boys admit the killing, but they claim self-defense. However, the boy they killed, the Puerto Rican boy, was blind. Blind? Mm -hmm. I've got a hunch the papers are going to play this like the Chicago Fire. You think we should try for first-degree murder? It looks like it to me. You want to prosecute? That's up to you. But before you make any decision, I think you ought to know. One of the defendants is a kid named Apache. I used to go with his mother when I was a kid. Oh, boy, Hank, the papers would have a field day with this one. I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Mr. Cole, but it, it seems to me that politically this is a dangerous case. Politically? <laughs> we don't care anything about politics now, do we? Huh? <laughs> well, well, sir, I, I think we're, we're all aware, sir, that there's something more than a groundswell developing to put you in the governor's mansion. Uh, I'm sure none of us would like to see anything happen oh, to jeopardize it. Now, now, the worst the newspapers can say is, honest DA prosecutes son of childhood sweetheart. Doesn't sound so damaging to me, huh? <laughs> all right, that's all for the moment, gentlemen. Hello, darling. Sweetheart. I'm beat. How's that for time? I earned this one today. Did you ever see such headlines? It's a hot case, all right. Mom, where's that white bra of yours? Hi, Dad. Hi, beautiful. Third drawer of the dresser, dear, where it always is. Okay. Jenny wearing a bra? Jenny's been wearing a bra for almost two years now. I guess I haven't taken a good look at her lately. One of those boys is only a year older than Jenny. I guess that's why it bothers me so. He was old enough to handle a knife. Whose idea was it anyway to go for murder one? Dan Cole's? Look, Harry. I Dan... know why he assigned this case to you. Because you're the only man smart enough to get him a first degree conviction. He'd frame his own mother to get that nomination. Karen, it wasn't Dan Cole's idea to go for first degree murder. It was mine. Yours? Yes. Mine. I don't believe it. Well, you came from that neighborhood yourself. Yes, and I got out. Yes, you did. But everybody hasn't got the emotional equipment to put up with the slums and the, and the poverty. And... Here we go with the Bassett theories of social oppression. Listen, Karen. Those punks have made Harlem a nightmare. People are afraid to walk home from the subway after dark. Remember the old man at the newsstand? The one who loaned me the money to buy a suit for my bar exam? Well, last week, four of your underprivileged children beat him up. They broke both his legs. He'll never walk again. And you're upset because three self-confessed killers are going to stand trial for murder. Good night, folks. Don't wait up for me. Oh, Jenny. I wasn't planning to. I'm going to bed at 12 o'clock after you. I mean, you can be such a drag sometimes, so utterly cubistic. You know what I mean, don't you, Dad? You heard your mother. 12 o'clock, doll. All right. I just hope I can explain it to Lonnie's satisfaction. Good night. Lonnie, whatever happened to Greg? He's been replaced by a more mature man, age 16. I ever meet Lonnie? You haven't even met Greg. Look, honey, let's not rank. Come on, we'll grab our things, go out to dinner, have a big, thick steak and a bottle of wine. What do you say? Okay. Oh, by the way, your old girlfriend, Mary DiPaci, called today. Twice. I referred her to your office. Did you talk to her? I don't know what to say to her. Well, why don't you just tell her that you're going to burn her son, for old time's sake?
Never mind what I've done. You told the police about the knife. Hey, Mr. Ruggiero? Uh, that's right. I hope for nobody to see you come here. Is this your daughter? I don't have them. I don't know nothing about them. Yeah, all right, come Take on, come home. on. All right, Mr. Ruggiero. Let's go. What are you going to do with girls like this? Some father. Calls the cops on his own daughter. He did the right thing. Your name is Angela, isn't it? They call you Angie. What did you do with the knives, Angie? You're so smart. Find them. You can get into a lot of trouble by concealing evidence. I you know, know that, don't you? All right, then. What did you do with the knives? I hid them in some newspapers. Then I got scared and threw them in the back of a car. What car? I don't know. Where was the car? I told you I don't know. It was just parked. Where? On the street. What street? I don't know. I don't know. Angie, I want you to listen to me. Nothing is going to happen to you if you try to help us. Now, please think. Where were you when you got rid of the knives? Tell me. The cops were all around. I just ran. I, I turned the corner, and there were more cops. I don't know which corner. I don't know, I don't know. All right, now about the car. What kind of a car was it? I'm not sure. It, it could have been a Ford or a Chevy. It was old, I think. You remember the color? I think it was dark, black, or maybe it was blue. I was, I was just so scared, I didn't know what to do. All right, Angie. Let's talk about the boys for a minute. Why did you take the knives in the first place? I don't know. I don't know. Did you do it for Reardon? Bad creep. Aposto? The Batman? No, it's on account of Danny. He's different. He's sweet. He's a darling. What do you know about him? I know he killed a boy in cold blood. No, he didn't. He just fought back. How do you know that? I told you because I saw it with my own eyes. What were you doing there? I just followed them. Why? I don't know. For kicks. What did you see? I was a ways behind them. The boy on the stoop pulled a knife. The boy on the stoop couldn't see. He still pulled a knife. It glittered. I saw it shining. Anybody else see it? I was alone. But there were a lot of other people around. They must have seen it. I talked to a lot of other people. Nobody saw it. You talked to a lot of Puerto Ricans. I think you're making this up, Angie, for Danny's sake. I'm not making it up, and you're not going to scare me into saying I am. I still can't get the blood off my skirt. Puerto Ricans put on a pretty good show, don't they? Yeah, great. Did this interest you, Barton? I thought your newspaper believed the only good Puerto Rican was a dead Puerto Rican. You haven't been reading our paper, Mr. Bell. Not lately. This is oppressed minority season with us. You ought to read it, Hank. Big expose on Park Avenue call houses. We perform a public service. Yes, I know. You tell the citizens how to get their asses home. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
We got the word that they concocted a story about the blind boy flashing a knife. Anything to that? Not a thing. Good. Because our readers are expecting the chair for the killers of this gentle and poetic blind boy. We'll do our best. Who tips them off to these things, anyway? A thousand and one, the girl was lying. But supposing he did have a knife. He would have been using it in self-defense. If he had a knife, we'll never make murder one stick with the jury. It's what you really want, isn't it? That's what I want. There's Cole, come on. Hey, come on, you guys! Hey, give him room, guys! Give him room, guys! Give him room, guys. Anything to give us today, Dan? Certainly. The city of New York will not rest until justice has been done. I've come to the funeral myself to make sure that is perfectly clear. The boys are right on the job, Dan. Morning, boys. Dan. Who are the boys in costume? The horsemen. Puerto Rican gang. Like to meet their leader? Yeah. Hey, Zorro! Come on over here a moment, will you? Cuidado! This is Mr. Cole, a district attorney. Zorro. You gonna burn the thunderbirds that killed Roberto? We're gonna try. <laughs> That'll be the day. What do you mean by that, son? You're kidding. Try. When your people come from Puerto Rico or Cuba, they're just inhuman to cops. It'll be the same old story this time. Mrs. Escalante, mother of the dead boy. Mrs. Escalante. Mrs. Escalante, I'm the district attorney. Please accept my condolences. Gracias. And this is Mr. Bell, the prosecutor. He'll help your son's case. You cannot help Roberto. It is too late to help Roberto. Mrs. Escalante, please believe me, Perdone, we... Perdóneme, senor. When I am a little girl, in my family, they teach me love. They teach me this in Puerto Rico, where I am born. The people there, they say to you, hello. Here is different. Here, so many people. But is no one here say to you, hello. In this city and on these streets is no time for love. There is only odio, hatred, hatred, and it is hatred is killed my son. Your son will have justice, Mrs. Escalante. Ah, senor, there's only one justice. You want to do something, eh? All right, you can do something for me. And for my son, one thing, kill them. Kill the murderers, the same way they kill my son. You put out their eyes, and you come at them with knives, the same way they came at my son in his darkness. You kill them like the animals they are. You kill them and you rid the streets of the animals. This you can do for me, senor. And for my son, who is dead. Ah, Dios me perdone. Is that what you're going to do, Hank? You're going to kill my kid? You're going to put his eyes out and come at him with knives in the darkness? You're going to kill him like an animal, huh? This is Lieutenant Gunnison, Miss, Mrs. Apache. Danny didn't have anything to do with this. I'm afraid he did. No, no. He's protecting somebody or something. I know him. 
I know he's my child. You don't know. He swore to me he's not even a member of this gang. It still happened, Mary. Is that what my child is to you? Just another case, another conviction? He's mine, Hank. Danny will have a fair trial, the same as the other two. You know this neighborhood. You're guilty before you're arrested. Mary. You look everywhere for evidence to prove that he's guilty. Are you looking for evidence to prove he's innocent? No, that wouldn't help you, would it? You wouldn't get a gold star, would you, Hank? They're all alike. They all say the same thing. My son didn't do it. My son couldn't do it. My son is a good boy. They all believe it, too. Puerto Rican boy. I want him to tell you something. Uh, Puedo hablar uh, con Jose, por favor? He came to see Danny last summer to thank him. Uh, sit down, Hank. Jose, could you come to my house right away? It's Danny's mother. Me pronto. Gracias, Jose. I went to look for him yesterday. Uh, sit down. How does he, uh, how does he get through no man's land? Well, he comes through the cellars and then, uh, to that old area way. Over the roof? Yeah. I remember. He'll be here right away. You, wait, Hank, I have to go to work in a, a minute. I work in an appliance store down. I'll wait. Cigarette? I'll, I'll get you some coffee. Yeah. No, don't. Jose? Jose, this is Mr. Bell. He's a friend of mine. There's amigo. You can talk to him. The Thunderbirds will kill me if they know I am here. And the horsemen worse. Me prometiste time and dollar. Jose, so you tell him, please. Go ahead, son. You know this swimming pool, mister, on 124th Street? Yes. Well, there's a cool in there. No fighting. I was there with some of the horsemen. I don't swim so good, see? What's the matter, Beaton? Look in the water. I don't see nothing in the water. Spicks. Well, what are they doing? You like swimming with them? <laughs> hey, Danny! Hey, Danny! Come here. Yeah, what's up, Dad? Take a look. San Juan's polluting the water. So you never saw a spit before? They swim here every day. Today, I don't like it. What are you, head of the immigration department or something? By me, I don't like it, and I say we kick them out. Danny, don't get into trouble. So that's your problem. 
You let a broad boss you, huh? All right, all right, big deal. Let's go get it over. a necklace for it. I thought only girls wore necklaces. Not no necklace. That's Jesus Christo. You got no religion? <laughs> you got religion. He's got religion, boy. <laughs> we want to see how religious you are, Spick. Don't you call me a Spick. We want to see if you can walk on water, Spick. Hey, I don't seem so good. The same boy who did this would stab to death a helpless blind boy? If he didn't do it, we'll find out he didn't do it. Believe me, Mary. You know, Hank, I made a terrible mistake when I walked out on you. I knew it the um, day after I married Johnny. He turned out to be a petty racketeer. I never told Danny what kind of man his father was. But he's a pretty sharp kid. And sometimes I would see him looking at me, thinking, what kind of woman is that? She marries a guy like that. And so, you know, just to make him think more of me, I, I would tell him about you. You know, when we uh, read your name in the papers, or I kind of heard about what you were doing. And then I would think, well, uh, you can't be a total mess. A man like that wanted to marry you. Don't give yourself the worst of it, Mary. You will try to see Danny as he really is, huh? I'll talk to him. He could have been our son. That was a long time ago, Mary. We've grown up. Maybe it's too bad, but we've grown up. Will Danny grow up? Goodbye, Hank. About the knives and the Escalante killing. Over. What about them? Well, did you find them? Not yet. Well, how many men did you put on them? All we can spare. Well, how many is that? Two. 
That's not enough, Lieutenant. You'll have to put more men on. And you better put out an all-points bulletin about that car. It could be anywhere by now. And I want daily progress reports from your office. In which order do you want these requests turned down? Over. Who is this character? I don't have all day, Bell. Over. Let me talk to the head of your department. He went on vacation this morning and is the only one who can give priority authorization for additional manpower. Well, doesn't he deputize anyone to do it for him? No, he doesn't. Well, does your whole department go to pieces because one man goes on a vacation? We'll find your knives as soon as we can, Mr. Bell. Of course, we only have to find an undescribed automobile which may be anywhere in the state of New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Arizona, or Texas. Not that we can't do it, you understand, in spite of being understaffed, overworked, and underpaid. But I'm sure you're not interested in our internal problems. Over. Look, Hardy, I hate to have to go to the DA on this. Over. Me too. Nice talking to you. Over and out. All right, where to, Hank? What? Where to? Raymond Street Jail. <laughs> to go to the country and see the cows. Instead, they sent me out on this crummy street to play with bad boys. Some parents, huh? Everybody wasn't their fault. They were poor. Okay, bad man. It's your turn. Oh, me, I'm, I'm stupid, you know. I, I'm pops, what we call it. Uh, I can't even read right, you know. And uh, The doctor, he says to me, he says that, that my brain's a little mixed up, you know, like, uh, I don't know, scramble legs. You know. Show him how stupid you are, stupid. Oh, dear. Now tell him how stupid you are. Oh, well, I've been in the sixth grade, I think, five times now, that's right. My old man's a drunk. My mother takes in boarders and goes out with them, too. I got a sister. I don't know if she's my sister. That's why I'm so disturbed. He's got a song about it. Yeah. Go ahead. Sing it, stupid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my mother sells snow to the snowbirds. Uh, my father makes barbershop gin. My sister sells jazz for a living. And that's why the money rolls in. Where's Dr. Walsh's office? Down at the end of that corridor. They're all yours. Hey, look, ain't you going to ask us no regular questions? On your feet. I don't want you to run another Rorschach. I don't care if he's faking. I don't care. What he's faking reveals just as much as his real reactions. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I gotta go. Bye. My name is Bell, DA's office. Oh, yes. I understand they're building a kid-sized electric chair upstate for you people. Well, now, Doctor, that's a nice, friendly approach. The indictment is first degree, isn't it? Usually is in premeditated murder. Bully and going home. I'm delighted you haven't fallen for any of that modern nonsense about emotional problems or environment or broken homes. A little mass execution now and then. That'll stop them, huh? And nothing else has. Look, Doctor, I came here to ask a couple of questions about these boys. I've already talked with Ridden and Aposto. <laughs> They're old pros. Those two have been through the mill here regularly since they were 10 or 11. Depache been in here before? No, this is his first. Tell me something about him. He's bright. IQ 135. Likes to read. Of course, the psychological tests show aggression and fear, just like the others. What about Ridden? Delusions of grandeur. Deep feeling of inferiority. Hates anybody whose skin of religion is different. Underneath, scared, of course. But scared more than the others. Is Apostle as stupid as he seems? Retarded. Very. As a psychiatrist, would you say he's legally sane? 
Now, you know that the words sane and insane have no meaning in medicine. They have in law. I deal in people, Mr. Bell, not in legal technicalities. <laughs> Where is Depache? In the juvenile section. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I hope you'll forgive my bad manners. Conditioned reflex with public officials, I'm afraid. Think nothing of it, Doctor. We all have our emotional problems. <laughs> side of the story, Danny. So you can help fry me? Do I look like a kook? Did my lawyers give you an okay to talk to me? They know I'm here. They must have told you you're in serious trouble. They told me I'm innocent until proven guilty. You'll get a fair trial if that's what you mean, but not in a children's court. A grown-up murder trial. You better tell me your story. Okay. In two words, self-defense. Danny, that's stupid and you know it. And you're stupid to stick to it. Tough and a half, so I'm stupid. And a little scared too, huh? But nobody scares me, especially a bum like you. Don't get fresh with me, Danny. I'm here because I'm a friend of your mother's. But don't con me, Mr. Bell. Bell, your name's Bellini, and you're a wop just like me. What's the matter, Mr. Bellini? You ashamed of being a wop? Let me tell you something, Mr. Bellini. Don't walk down any dark streets alone. You haven't got the guts to handle a skinny broad, much less the Thunderbirds. You look kind of fruity to me anyway. And stay away from my mother, you face wop! Excuse me. I'm looking for Zaro. No habla inglés, señor. Nada. Por favor, ¿dónde está el señor Zaro? Well, well, don't bother me. Vamos, señor. Brings it to my turf. I'd like to talk with Louisa Escalante. Why? She was there the day it happened. I'd like to talk with her. Vete, dile a Luisa Escalante que nos esperen las tres putas. Shoot meters. Come on, I'll buy you a beer. suit. Oh, you know Harlem, huh? I used to live here. They think I'm a cop and they don't want to be around if there's going to be a pinch. Oh, you know this place, all right. A guy gets pinched, he like, uh, throws stuff away in my lane your feet. Next thing you know, you're arrested for holding. Or maybe even for intent to sell. That's not true, Bruce Miguel. Good beer here. You'll like it. So you're working for Roberto, huh? Well, that's one way of putting it. The birds ain't got a chance. Or have they? I think we've got a very good case. Yeah? Well, man, you'll give it to them good. The others are bad, but they're the worst. You don't like them, do you? Any of them. Well, man, put yourself in my shoes. The niggers look down on us. The wops look down on us. The Irish were here before the Indians. Man, my people had a proud race. But are we going to African jungle? And the wops, what the hell did they ever have? Mussolini? A big stink. Michelangelo? So what? Uh, you ever heard of a guy named Picasso? Yes. Now, Pablo Picasso, man. I went all the way down to the museum to look at his paintings. Now, that cat is great. He's the greatest artist ever lived, man. He sings. And you know, that's the delivery kit that don't want to pay. 
You know, because uh, it's got the same blood in his veins that I got in mine. And you know the first fiddle at the music hall? Puerto Rican. Come on. Got a contribution to your war chest? <laughs> Look, we got three square blocks here. Like this is an island, little Puerto Rico. You know what I mean, Mr. Bell? Then we bust them to get out. But while we're here, we gotta protect our turf. People gotta respect us. And you know what people respect? Force. Here, yeah. our contribution to your favorite charity. You know that that ain't the point. It ain't the money. We just can't let people come in and out of here without knowing whose place it is. Like the Thunderbirds, huh? Yeah, like the Thunderbirds. Look what happened to poor Roberto. A poor innocent blind kid who never did anyone no wrong. Tell me something. Thunderbirds know you protect your turf. How do you explain three of them coming down here and invading it? The Thunderbirds are all on junk, that's why. They're dope addicts, you know. That's right. Those boys weren't on junk. You're right. They weren't on junk. Not then, anyway. But it's that weird. What about the other two? A pasta? <laughs> A oh, pasta man. joking. Oh, man, that cat does anything anybody tells him. And Apache? He's a wild one. You know, he helped one of our guys out of trouble once. Now, why would a wop want to help us pick? Oh, no. It's that weird. He's got holes in his head. I put one of them there. When I smacked that chump, he went down, and I stomped him in the head. You know why? So he wouldn't get up again. If he did, you might go down. He'd stop you. You sound like you've been stomped before. A touch here and there. Man, this popping is for no one, man. It's for riding on toilet walls. It just stinks, man. It stinks. That's what this popping is. Mama Escalante no deja venir a Luisa. Uh-huh. Well, the old lady won't let her baby come down to this place, so you can talk to her at the house, OK? What are you, bartender? The beers are on me. Let me. I said the beers are on me. Thanks. This is Escalante. I'd like to talk with your daughter. You can talk to her right here. Louisa, I'd like to ask you... Just what happened the night Roberta was killed? I told the cops many times. I know, but I, I'd like you to tell me. Gina, I was sitting here. Maria was there. We saw them coming. They jumped for Roberto and started killing him. That's all. Did Roberto have a knife? A knife? Un cuchillo. Un cuchillo. Your policemen keep asking for this knife. And why? And it is not true. Roberto never have a knife. Three boys said he pulled a knife. This is a lie. A girl saw it, too. That is not so. Who is this girl? Louisa, can you tell me something? This girl said she saw something that glittered. What was it that glittered? It's glittered. Shine. Oh. 
It's harmonica. The harmonica on which he plays his music. This is what shined. This is what you mean. Ladies and gentlemen, meet our next governor, Mr. Dan Cole. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends, forgive me. I apologize for being late. Something about doing a profile on me. <laughs> and that's great. Just Call great. Albany first and then the White House. Uh, congratulations, sir. Oh, Thank you. Here. Wonderful, Dan. <laughs> oh, food. Not too rare for Mr. Cole. Yes, sir. Make mine rare, please. Make Mr. Bell's rare. Hank, do you realize that a conviction in the Escalante case is worth a 50,000 plurality right in this district alone? 50,000? Oh, that's an electrical figure. <laughs> I should say you can count on that plurality, Dan. Ah, case going that well, huh? As of now, I see no reason why we can't get first-degree convictions. You know what to be a shoe-in. Say, Hank, I got a great idea for publicity. Why don't you get your picture taken pulling the switch on the electric chair? You have a definite political potential, Hank. But you must have cooperation right straight down the line. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me, Mr. Cole. I'm a great believer in electricity. <laughs> My wife majored in sarcasm at Vassa. Yes. Excuse me, please. <laughs> now hear this. Before Dan Cole tells us what he thinks, I should like to tell you all what I think. <laughs> I think that Dan Cole is riding on the crest of a wave. <laughs> and I'm mighty proud. I'm proud of our party, and I'm proud of Dan Cole. I'm proud of old Hank Billy. And goodbye, Mr. Supreme Court uh, Justice. Our campaign coming up, and it's going to mean shoulder to the wheel work for all of us. 3,000 more votes. All you got to do is electrocute a few kids. You third generation progressive, sitting up at Vassar getting your fat checks from daddy. When was the last time you had a scrounge for a buck? You think I can afford this phony idealism of yours? I've got a job to do, and I'm getting that car. How do you think she feels? We've assigned Kirk and Brodsky to stay with her until this is over. How do you do? Go on and make yourself at home. There's lots of coffee on the stove. Where's that candy store where the Thunderbirds hang out? Why? You think it'll go on up to Italian Harlem? Well, it wasn't Puerto Ricans that paid us a visit last night. All right, I'll go with you. No, no, I want to return this visit personally. Now, why don't we have the tea birds picked up and brought in? What's the address? On 17th and 1st, Manetti's Candy Store. Pretty boy Savarisi, he's your man. Help you, Mac? 
I understand the Thunderbirds hang out here. Look, mister, I only sell sodas here. That's all. Now from the DA's office. I have a list of all the names and addresses of the Thunderbirds. Now I can have them picked up and brought down for questioning, or you can tell me where I can find Pretty Boy Savarisi. Hey. Hey. Come on over. Just reading about some character from the DA's office. His wife got scared by some crazy cats in the past. Bonjo, get the district attorney a chair. No, thanks. That ain't polite. Where's pretty boy Savarisi? You know, you got a lot of courage, Mr. District Attorney, coming in here without no escort. You gonna tell me where I can find pretty boy Savarisi, or do I have to run you in? Well, now, what exactly was it you wanted to see him about, huh, Mr. District Attorney? Where's your telephone? Hey, hey, Mr. District Attorney. What's the matter? Can't you take a little joke? Don't get excited. We clown around like this all the time. Makes life interesting, you know? La side of Dominique and Dato? Dietro. Why are you there, Luigi? Quell him the chiller de Marisciaro, Volo Palari, Colori. Never mind. I'll tell him myself this imbecile from the DA's office wants to see him. Da dove tu te credo che io vengo, stupido? Io sono italiano. Did you knock? But you got no menace? You pretty boy, Savarisi? You know why they call me pretty boy, Mr. Bell? I can guess. Because I'm ugly. Anybody calls me ugly, they're dead. Dead. The table's crooked. Floor's on a bias. You're a mighty tough character, aren't you? You heard of me, huh? Sixteen times I got my name in the papers. Most of the time, when they give the wrong address, they don't spell the name right. Savarese! You're, uh... You're Italian, too. Right, Mr. Bell? Put that back. Listen, you bum. Two of your punks came down to my apartment house last night and terrorized my wife. Yeah, I was, I was sorry to hear about that. The hot-headed kids, you know how it is. You can't keep an eye on all your troops. They're members of your gang and you're their leader. If it ever happens again, I'll hold you responsible, personally. Mr. Bell, I said I apologize. Please tell your wife I'm sorry. Remember what I said. Mr. Bell. Cue ball, please. Thanks, Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell! Of course, it, it's kind of hard keeping your boys in line when they hear you spend the evening drinking with the Spicks. Yeah, we know all about you palling around with the horsemen over the Tres Putas. They're, they're all on the stuff, you know that, don't you? Well, that's where they got their name, Horsemen, Big H for heroin. Well, any of our boys get on the junker. I break their arm. Cues walk. Another thing, Mr. Bell. You've been coaching their star witness. Hey, did they hear that? Those are three nice guys you're trying to frame. Those three nice guys committed murder. Well, lots of nice guys all through history kill people. In a war, the more people you kill, the more medals you get. Oh, that'll make them any less nice, does it? What about that guy invented the H-bomb? He got the biggest medal of all. Some honor. Like, like you went around saying, what a great guy. He invented cancer. No, sir, Mr. Bell. You're making a big mistake trying to frame those three guys. They're okay, every one of them. They got heart. Heart to chop down a blind boy, playing a harmonica. Well, maybe that blind kid needed chopping down. Did you ever think of that, Mr. Bell? You think being blind made that kid an angel or something? Being blind got him killed. All right. Do you want to know the truth about Escalani? Yeah, it'll rock you. I thought he was just a blind kid, too. So nobody noticed. So he's blind, so what? And I heard the horsemen were busting out, robbing the gang in the next block. So I had myself a look. The rumble for real, sip guns, check hammers, the works. And I saw something phony. Something that didn't fit. 
blind angel. But why? The cops got the word and I found out why. The little creep was their cover up, their arson. They ditched their guns on it. Every one of those horsemen was clean, man. The cops couldn't hold a one. Smart man, he was a top warlord in their gang. That nice little blind boy. And Diablo. I just called you fellas in to ask you to be nice enough to escort the district attorney to the edge of our turf. <laughs> Zorro live, honey. Thank you. Well, hello, Mr. Bell. Come on in. Yourself comfortable. I can't offer you any beer, but I'll let you sip one of your cigarettes. Why did you lie to me? Did I lie to you, Mr. Bell? Roberto Escalante was a leader in your gang. Uh huh. So you really been playing detective, huh? Listen, punk. You may run these three square blocks, but when I talk to you, I want the truth. Well, it's a cruel world, Mr. Bell. And blind kids can't sit around doing nothing just because they're blind. And since you're so interested, I'll tell you something else. Robert wasn't just Luis's brother. He was a pickup man. Luis is a prostitute? Luis is a hooker. And Roberto was a blind pickup man for his own sister. How does that grab you, Mr. Bell? And now, I'll tell you something else. I don't care. I don't care if he beat his mother or sold pot. Roberto was killed in cold blood by three guys who hit him because he had a darker skin. Reardon came in like those Japs during the war, kamikaze. Ready to stick someone Spanish on home ground. He found Roberto and killed him. Now the law says that you die for that, Mr. Bell. And it's your job to see that those three guys die for it. But this we want. I don't care whether you're making out with the patches old lady or not. Just don't cop out on us. Give me a cigarette. Hello, Dan. This is Hank. I'm up in Harlem. Listen to this. It turns out our poor defense's blind boy was a top leader in the horsemen and a procurer for our star witness who, at the age of 16... Can you hold it a minute, Hank? Jack, that press release on Louisa Escalante, kill it. And you'd better call that columnist, the one who was going to do the poem about the little blind boy. Tell him to forget it. Never mind why. Okay, now. What does that do to us? Well, I haven't had time to figure out all the details, but I'd like to go back and take another crack at that Danny DePache. Hank, you can't do it. You're too close to trial to interrogate those boys now. The defense would raise the roof. We've got to take the chance, Dan. I want to try to break that boy down. Hank, absolutely no. Dan, I'll call you when I get back.
Mr. Bell has some questions to ask you. Uh, something very important has come up. You, you can trust him. Danny, maybe it'll help us. I told you to stay away from her. Danny, are you a member of the Thunderbirds? Who cares? Well, your mother cares for one. I understand you swore. You swore that you'd never join a gang. What if I did? Did you break that promise to her? Did you, Dan? Why? Why, Danny? The Thunderbirds are my friends. Danny, you put Reardon down once to save a Puerto Rican boy. Now, what happened in between to make you go along and kill one? In between, I found out who my friends really are. Your friends got you in here. What are you trying to do? Split me from the rest? Get me to turn state evidence? You're not like those boys. Trust him, you tell me, and he sneaks up on me and tries to get me to rat on my friends. I shouldn't even be talking to you, coming here with him. Yeah, you are pretty cozy together. What are you doing, shacking up with him? <laughs> You shouldn't have walked me home. Maybe it would have been smarter you drive me. Thank you, Hank. I guess I haven't been much of a mother, huh? But maybe if he had a father, he'd have. Yeah, some father. I don't know. I always heard that a boy got in trouble because he didn't have love. I love Danny more than anything in the world. You just thank God, Hank, you didn't have to raise your kid on these streets. Good night. Doctor, is it all right if I smoke? If you have to. Come, 
How do you feel? Oh, man. Man, I feel sick. <laughs> That's a surprise. I was this far. This far from killing him. Hello, Karen. I'm all right, honey. Hello, gorgeous. Daddy. I was Spike trying to steal third base. Man, got us in totus. It's not as bad as it looks. Just a couple of ribs. I'll be all right. I'll live. I've got to. I. I've got to get ready for that trial a week from Monday. Or am I confused? No, not for a minute. I protected my face so I wouldn't put in too bad an appearance. Vanity. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between the police department and the DA's office. You boys protect your pretty faces. Our boys protect their kidneys. Stop making jokes, Kenneth. <laughs> Which gang was it, Daddy? I don't know, gorgeous. T-Birds or horsemen. Might have been either one or both. Karen. I was, I was choking him. And I, I couldn't stop. Well, I wish to hell you hadn't. Hadn't stopped. All right, now let's turn him over on his left side. Gently, easy. Gently. Karen? Yes, love. He was 15 or 16 years old. And I was trying with all my heart to kill him. You know? I know. Hello, Val. We found the knives. What? Who is this? This is Lieutenant Hardy. Lieutenant Hardy? Oh. Well, hang on a second. What's the matter, Hardy? I said we found the knife. You found the knife? Is that what you called me for, to tell me you found those damn knives? What's the matter, Bell? You said these knives were important. Well, what could I possibly do with them at this hour of the night? What a suggestion? You're not very funny, Hardy. What condition are they in? Bloody. Well, send them over to the lab. I want blood type and fingerprints after sunrise. Aren't you interested in how we found them? Not very. Anything else? A lady in Kew Gardens found her three-year-old daughter chewing on the handle of one of them in the back seat of a light green Plymouth. You helped a lot with the description of the car, Bell. Dark Ford or Chevy. Hardy, don't ever call me at this hour of the night again. Nighty night. <laughs> Joe, you may have to put a little makeup on that before you go to trial. That's all I need. What do you think of your little victims of social oppression now? I don't know what you mean. You're pretty sure of yourself the other night at Cole's party. I'm sorry about that, Hank. I made a fool out of myself. Bully for Escalante, you said. 
Darling, I got a marvelous idea for a publicity stunt. Get a picture of you pulling a switch on the electric chair. It's not a very funny joke. The voice of the martini. You weren't that drunk. You know what you were saying. Darling, it's late. Let's go to bed. We can talk about this in the morning. Those hoodlums scared you half to death. And they almost killed me. You still think they need special consideration? Special attention? You don't think I condone that kind of violence, do you? I've gone a hundred miles out of my way to find out what makes these monsters tick. I've been to Harlem time and again, to their homes. They spit in my face. What more can anyone do? What would you do? I don't know. Don't you? All right, I, I made a mistake. Was it a mistake? Don't you believe what you said? All right, Hank. I meant every word I said the other night. Something else you said. Old Hank Bellini. Danny DePache said it, too. What's the matter, Mr. Bellini? Are you ashamed of being a wife? My old man was ignorant. He thought the way to be a good American was to change your name. It was always easy for me to explain. My father did. Now I realize I not only went along with it, I was glad. I was secretly glad my name was Bell instead of Bellini. It was part of getting out of home. It's like marrying you. You married me because you loved me. Hank, I know what you're going through now. Somehow you'll find the answer. Daniel DePache and Anthony Aposto of premeditated murder in the first degree on the 25th day of July, 1960, in the county of New York, by feloniously stabbing Roberto Escalante, and at the stated time and place, causing the death of said Roberto Escalante, without excuse or justification. Signed, Foreman of the Grand Jury, William Henry Baines. Does the defense wish to open? This is the lab report on these knives. Your Honor. Thanks, Harley. Ladies and gentlemen, read it? When I get ready. I didn't like think we'd find it, did you? didn't. They just turned up. Which the it's quite interesting. So ably read. You better read it. It is not fact, but a mere accusation. I'm sure you will keep your minds open until you have heard all the evidence from both sides and that your verdict will be a just one. Thank you for your attention. State your name, address, and age. Luisa Maria Felipa Garcia Escalante, 49 and a half West 110th Street, 16 years old. Luisa, are you the sister of the murdered boy? Objection! Rephrase your question, Mr. Bell. Are you the sister of Roberto Escalante? I was. On the afternoon of July 25th, 1960, were you seated on the front steps of the apartment house where you live at 49 and a half West 110th Street? Yes, sir. Who was there with you? My brother, Roberto. Anyone else? Yes, sir. My friend, Maria Creva. What were you doing there? I was talking. And your brother? He was making music on the harmonica. The three of you were seated on the front steps, minding your own business, Watching the world go by, is that correct? Roberto was not watching the world go by. You mean he was blind? Yes. And he was playing the harmonica? Yes. Did anything happen to disturb that moment? Them! Those boys! Louisa, Louisa try to control yourself. Just sit right down. Try to tell me as clearly and as calmly as you can just what happened. Three boys 
came down the street. When they got by our stoop, they pulled knives out of their pockets and stabbed Roberto. They stabbed him many times. They killed him. Did he draw a knife? He did not have no knife. Did he act in any way as though he were going to attack them? Why would he attack those boys? He did not know they was there. He was blind. Why would he attack those three boys? What did the boys do then, Louisa? They run away. Did you get a good look at them before they ran away? Yes, sir. If you saw them again, would you recognize them? Yes, sir. Are they in this courtroom? Right over there. Louisa, just so there can be no possibility of a mistake, just so the court will know exactly who you're talking about, I want you to leave the witness stand, go to the three boys who killed your brother, and place your hand on the shoulder of each one to identify them. Miss Escalade, the court realizes the extent of your emotional involvement in this case. I nice work, huh? with you in the law of your brother. Here, read this. Quite interesting. Interruptions. I'm not through with her yet. Now, if you'd like a short recess no. to come. No, I I'm all right. I'll be all right. I want to answer the questions. Louisa, what is your occupation? Occupation? What do you do for a living? You're on the road, Louisa. Remember that. What do you do for a living? I am a hooker. You mean you're a prostitute? Yes. When did you become a prostitute? I was 14. You became a prostitute when you were 14? Yes. Were you coerced into it? Objection, Your Honor. I see no purpose to this line of questioning. Bell, do you have a point here which applies to the case? I do, Your Honor. Proceed. Were you coerced into this profession? Coerced? Did someone, an older man, for instance, cause you to become a prostitute? No, sir. I thought of it myself. You thought of it yourself? Why? We had no money, and my mother was sick. Couldn't you get a job? I was 14. I tried to get a job. They do not give me a working permit. Well, what about your brother? He was blind. Did you make some money this way? I did. Did your mother ask you where you got the money? Yes. What did you tell her? I told her I was on the street. You told your mother you were a prostitute? Yes. What did she say? She said, why didn't we let her die? Mr. Bell, why are you pursuing this line? Your Honor, I'm trying to get at the truth. 
Thank you, Louisa. No more questions. Your witness, Mr. Randolph. No questions. Is the defense ready? Your Honor, the defense requests a short recess. Court will recess for 10 minutes. That was a masterful presentation, Hank. Come on out the hall. Have your picture taken with us. You go ahead, Dan. I want to look at the soldiers. We're ready, Dan. That was nice. State your name, age, and address. Anthony Pasto, uh, 16. Well, what was that? Your address. The court has Anthony Apostle's address. Anthony, sit down. Anthony Apostle, are you also known as Batman? Yeah. Well, um, why do they call you Batman? I don't know. Everybody calls me Batman. Where'd you get the name? Batman, he's in the comics. I see. Do you uh, like reading comic books, Anthony? Yeah, sure. I, I like the pictures, you know. What about the words, Anthony? Well, they're OK, too, I guess, yeah. Well, then uh, perhaps you have a little trouble with the words. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm not such a hot reader. Anthony, uh, what do you like about Batman? Batman. Well, he ain't afraid of nothing, you know. And he, well, he, he wears this cool black suit all the time. And, uh, well, he, he's always fighting, you know. Do you like to fight, Batman? Sure. Are you a good fighter, Batman? Oh, boy, my old man, I tell you, you know something, I pack a hell of a wallop. That's right. Why? Has he watched you? No, I walloped them once. Why do you like to fight, Batman? I don't know why. Try to think why. Well, why what? Try to think why you like to fight. Because it makes me feel good? You really got your work cut out for you here. He's even got me convinced this kid is a nut. Anthony, uh, if this court frees you, what will you do with your life? Where am I going to get from? Just answer the question, Anthony. The question? The question. If this court frees you, what will you do with your life? I don't know. Well, if you were released this afternoon, what would you do with the rest of the day? I'd go back to the block. And tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow. I don't know. I mean, I gotta know what I do tomorrow, you know. It's... Anthony, please try to answer the question. I don't know. Dr. Walsh, you heard Anthony Aposto testify that he likes to fight because it makes him feel good. Now, could you explain this testimony to the jury? In layman's terms, please. Apostol's gratification from fighting stems from two sources. One, fighting gives him status. And two, in layman's terms, Apostol enjoys pain. Dr. Walsh, do you believe Anthony Aposto to be capable of an act, say an act of extreme violence, which requires premeditation? Premeditation would not be consistent with Apostol's pattern. The state of New York, uh, may I? By all means. Is your employer, is it not, Dr. Walsh? Well, I work for the state, yes. You realize you are testifying against the state of New York. 
<laughs> well, I realize that. Doesn't it uh, frighten you to be testifying in opposition to your employer? The truth is the truth. Then in your I got our own man up there and demolish that testimony and do it now. Later, it won't have impact. Dr. Andrade, as a qualified psychiatrist, I'd like to talk to you for a moment about Arthur Rin. In your report to our office, you indicated that he had more than normal aggression, I believe you said, along with delusions of grandeur. Yes, those are parts of my findings. He had fantasies about becoming a very important man in this neighborhood. He dreamed about growing up to be a bigger man in this field than Al Capone. Yes, he did. Doctor, you're a very experienced psychiatrist. In your opinion, in your professional opinion, what is the cause of these unmanageable aggressions and delusions? Fear. Fear? Arthur Reardon is a very frightened young man. Would you say as a generalization he's insecure? Or as a specific, that he is a coward? Well, a layman might so describe him, yes. A coward and a bully? I don't know what the word bully means to you, Mr. Bell. A bully is a person so cowardly that he attacks only those who cannot defend themselves. Like a blind boy. I would call him a bully and a coward. It's a lie, you stinking pig! Order. Hey, no one call me scared get the way. Order. Arthur, sit down. Order. Let there be order in this court. I instruct the court attendants that in the event of another outburst from this defendant, they ought to bind him and gag him so that this trial will not be interrupted again. What do you mean, gag me? This country's free speech, isn't it? What do you mean, trying to tell me what I can say and do? Gag the defendant. How are you going to gag me? I got my right! I think it's bigger than you! Thank you. This is going to work against us. This makes him look like a hot headed maniac instead of a cold blooded killer. We're going to have a terrible time proving premeditation now. Dr. Andrade. You testified that, in your professional opinion, Anthony Apostol was aware of the quality and nature of his act when he stabbed Roberto Escalante. Objection! When and if he stabbed Roberto Escalante. That is correct. Doctor, how can you say what was definitely in the mind of Anthony Apostol when and if he stabbed another boy? So far, science has found no means of determining what definitely goes on in the mind of a man. If Anthony Apostle did not know what he was doing, then he'd be innocent in the eyes of the law, wouldn't he? I'm afraid I can't answer questions about the law. Well, let me put it this way, Doctor. Is there in your mind uh, the slightest shadow of a doubt that Anthony Apostle knew what he was doing when he stabbed Roberto Escalante? But I, I have no psychic powers. I can't answer your question. You are aware that under the laws of the United States, a man is presumed innocent or proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, yes, 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 I am. Thank you, Doctor. No more questions. That's all, Doctor. Call the next witness. We call Daniel DePache. What are you doing? I'm looking for the truth. There's a proper procedure for having the truth. I didn't put you on this case to lose it. I'm looking for justice. The jury decides justice. I'm taking you off this case, Hank. Do that, Dan. I'd like to hear you explain it to the newspapers. Would you have stabbed him if he hadn't drawn his knife? No, sir. So you only stabbed him to defend yourself. Thank you, Danny. Your witness, Mr. Bell. Your Honor, I have here three knives I'd like to place in evidence. Also, a sworn statement by one, Angela Rogello the effect that these are the knives handed her by the defendants on July 25th. The statement goes on to say that Angela Ruggiero wrapped the knives in a newspaper and threw them in the back seat of an automobile that same afternoon in the same condition in which they were given her. And finally, I have a police lab report on the condition of the knives when they were found. I would like to place this in evidence, but at the proper time. May I have the knives, please? Mark the statement.
You recognize these knives, Danny? No. You're under oath, Danny. Don't add perjury to the charge against you. Is that any worse than going to the chair, huh? I don't recognize them. This your knife? I don't remember. This one? I don't remember. What about this one? I don't remember. Don't you recognize any of these knives, any one of them at all? Objection. Badgering the witness. Witness has already answered the question. Reaction is sustained. Danny, are you afraid to admit which knife is yours? No, I'm not afraid. Then why can't you recognize your knife when you see it? Objection. Counsel is assuming a fact, not in evidence. There is no testimony linking any of the knives with the witness. I'll sustain that. Danny, you're a very bright young man with a very high IQ. You think the jury is going to believe that you can't recognize your knife when you see it? I don't care whether they believe it or not. Who spotted Roberto Escalante first? I don't remember. Who stabbed him first? We all stabbed him at the same time. How many times did you stab him? I don't remember. When I saw you in Welfare Island. You told me you stabbed Roberto Escalante four times. I must object. I'll rephrase the question, Your Honor. Danny, did you or did you not confess that you stabbed Roberto Escalante? Yeah, in self-defense. Did you also not confess that you stabbed him four times? Answer yes or no. Objection. Witness can always explain his answer. A witness will please answer the last question. Yeah, I guess I said that. And you stabbed him with this knife? I object. Answer yes or no. I object. Counsel has still failed to identify the knife. I cannot question this witness properly if my every word is going to be examined. You're bullying the witness. Damn it, you put him on the witness stand, didn't you? Well, I must caution you about profanity in this courtroom. Your Honor, I'm sorry. But I think I'm on the verge of establishing which knife is his. If I may proceed, please. Witness will answer the last question. Read back the last question. And you stabbed him with this knife. Well, Danny? Look, what if it is? Answer the I... question, yes or no. Is this your knife? Yes, 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 and yes. And how many times did you stab him? Four, four. Why, Danny? I told you he came Why, at me. Why, Danny? I don't know. Why, why? Because the other... Because the others, they... Because the others stabbed him. Yes, yes. And, and so they... you stabbed him? Yes, I stabbed him four times. Look, what do you want from me? I stabbed him. I stabbed him. I stabbed him. You're lying, Danny. You never stand. Your Honor, I want this report placed in evidence. It's an official report from the Criminal Identification Laboratory. It states that the Swiss blade knife, the one with the black and white handle, the one you identified as your knife, did not have a single trace of blood on it. Your knife, Danny, and not a single trace of blood. No, no, I wiped it clean. It Nobody does... could wipe it that clean. Nobody could wipe it so clean that the police lab wouldn't find a single trace of blood on it. No, Danny. You never stabbed him at all. You only pretended to stab him. No, no, you I... You turned the handle of the blade around, and you stabbed him here on the shoulder. No, no, I stabbed him. I stabbed him. You're lying, Danny. Danny, what are you afraid of? <laughs> Danny, did you kill Roberto Escalante? I never killed anybody in my life. Never, never. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, Danny. All right. I hate crying. Crying is for babies. Crying is for men, too. Who killed Roberto Escalante? Anthony Aposto, a mental defective that an efficient society would have taken off the streets long ago, Arthur Redden? A young man so crippled by the pressures and poverty of slum life that, that his rage makes him even more dangerous than a pasto and less capable of controlling his emotions? Or Danny DePache, whose values are so twisted by the strange social order that he's afraid to admit he didn't kill. Well, you're out of order. Sorry, Your Honor. No further questions. Mr. Randolph? Your 
Honor, the defense rests. This court will recess. Listen, Bell, my newspaper's very disappointed in your performance. Tell me, did your friendship with Mary Devine... Go on, we'll write anything you want. Oh, no comment. What do you plan, Mr. Cole? Are you expecting to be sent to the governor's mansion on the prestige you're going to get from this case, huh? Any statement? Yes, Barton. Keep out of my sight. Arthur Ed, the sentence of this court is that you be confined in the Elmira Reception Center for a period of not less than 20 years and no more than your natural life. Anthony Apostle, this court commits you to the Madawan State Hospital for the criminally insane until such a time as you may be judged ready to again take your place in society. Daniel Depache, you've acted in concert with the other two defendants, and as such, you became an accomplice. However, the court has seen fit to be lenient in your case, finds you guilty of third-degree assault. We're going to send you to the boys' prison at Elmira, New York, for a period of one year, for classification, treatment, and rehabilitation. This court is adjourned. Hank. 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 What about my son? Is this your justice for a dead blind boy? What about the animals who killed my son? A lot of people kill your son, Mrs. Escalante.